Garth Massey has created a business around teaching critical military leadership skills to the civilian sector. Up next on Veteran on the Move. Welcome to Veteran on the Move. If you're a veteran in transition, an entrepreneur wannabe, or someone still stuck in that J-O-B trying to escape, this podcast is dedicated to your success. And now, your host, Joe Crane. If you're a veteran interested in a new game plan, 7-Eleven may have what you're looking for. Their structured franchise program is a perfect fit for your experience and skills. Franchise with a leader. It's a smart game plan for vets and a win for 7-Eleven. Check out the details at veteranonthemove.com slash 7-Eleven. Garth Massey has transitioned the critical leadership skills taught to our military designed to ensure a nation is ready to win battles in every environment and transform them for the current business culture. His methodology has been applied across industries from healthcare to construction and video gaming to manufacturing. Providing workshops and development programs for companies looking to prepare for the future, develop their teams, and have a little fun. Garth is a 21-year veteran of the Marine Corps, currently commanding a Reserve Infantry Battalion in Southern California. All right, Garth Massey, welcome to Veteran on the Move. Before we get to talking about business and entrepreneurship like we always do, why don't you go go back and uh, tell us what you've been doing in the Marine Corps? Sure, Joe. Uh, I started in the infantry uh, back in 95 and uh, did a hardship tour out in 2-3, out in Hawaii. And after spending about four years, four and a half years there, uh, got moved back uh, to Pendleton. And I decided to get out uh, and join the reserves right away. So it was about 2001 in April. And uh, as I was kind of exploring reserve options and looking for things to do while I started my first job in the civilian side, Uh, September 11th happened, and by sheer good fortune, I was in the first reserve battalion that got called up uh, in response to the beginning of the war on terror. So uh, I haven't been able to to step away from it since. So I I still serve in the reserves, do one weekend a month, and as my wife would like to point out, uh, an extra weekend just for chesty polar, and then uh, (laughs) one or two ATs every summer. And uh, I currently am the battalion commander for 2nd Battalion, 23rd Marines, which is headquartered here in Pasadena, California. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a busy battalion. We've sent a good 200 guys in our battalion of nearly a thousand, uh, overseas in the last 12, 14 months and, uh, actively engaged in missions from Central America, South America, Europe, uh, and the Middle East. Uh, so I still stay pretty, in, pretty engaged on the infantry side of things. Yeah. You know, I've, uh, I've been out, been out of the Marine Corps for about three years now. I'm retired now, but, uh, I was down at Mar 4 Res in New Orleans when the, initial mobilization was going on helping with that whole process and uh i remember when 23rd you know some of the battalions in the 23rd battalion started getting or 23rd regiment excuse me started uh getting mobilized and then it just went from there um yeah so I, I, it is interesting uh even in the last 12 to 14 months uh at least in in part or in whole there's uh still uh, marine corps reserve mobilizations happening yeah, a lot of it's individual stuff, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it, for us too, it draws a lot of questions out that I think are, makes your podcast interesting. So several of my officers are, and staff and CEOs are starting businesses or looking for ways to transition because they'll do nine months, uh, you know, three month workup, six months overseas, and then they come back and the jobs that were there for them have changed or a new opportunity has presented itself or they've saved up the money and they're trying to to take that leap. So we actually, as a battalion, do a lot of things to try and tie veterans in with opportunities when they come back. Um, so it's been a nice balance of, of uh, both the civilian side and then using the reserves to help spring launch, you know, careers or, or companies when people get back. Right. You know, and, and having spent uh, several years at reserve units myself uh, as a reserve, as a reservist and an active reservist, um, there, there is, there are some really good jobs to have if you're in the reserves, like police, firemen, airline pilots, you know, th- those kinds of things. But right. uh, most, you know, most uh, nine to five business jobs, the, you know, they want you there all the time and they're not real happy about letting you leave early on Friday or show up yeah. late, late on Monday morning. So it is tough. And I, I found, you know, the, the shifting gears back and forth in some ways being a reservist is more difficult than being on active duty because it, mainly because of the mind shift, the mind sure. mindset shift that you have to go through all the time. We have used kind of our relationship with each other uh, to help support the startups. I would say, 
maybe 40% of our, our staff and officers have their own companies or something like it. Um, here in LA, we run a group called, uh, veterans for American business development. We, we made a nonprofit, but, uh, VABD.org and, uh, we just got the site up and launched, but what we do is every month we get veterans from the LA area together and we do a tour of Los Angeles. So last month we went down to SpaceX and they were kind enough to show a group of about 20 of us around. Uh, the month before that it was Red Bull. The month before that it was uh, Avery Dennison. The month before that City National Bank and uh, DreamWorks. And uh, we're going to Disney next month through the corporate uh, citizenship headquarters. So every month this group of veterans gets to see the inside of another business, another company, another industry. Um, and we mix it up anywhere in Los Angeles, any industry. But what happens is all the reserve officers, uh, the staff and CEOs who are looking at starting companies or any veteran in the LA area that finds us is welcome to come join. And it's not necessarily a, a job hunt. We don't pass out resumes, uh, but we do look for ways to learn about other companies and to get a chance to network and support each other. So it's a pretty powerful group. And uh, we've been doing that for about a year and seen some incredible companies. So. Yeah, it sounds great. Uh, you know, one of the things I loved about uh, the reserves and being around uh, reservists was you get to see what you get to see what Marines do become uh, when they get out of the Marine Corps, but yet they're still in the Marine Corps. It's, and and because when you're active duty, it's not really okay or really cool at times to talk about what job you're getting when you get out because you already got short timers attitude or right. you know, that that stigma surrounding it. But er, when you're in a reserve unit, everybody theoretically already is out. You know, there are some active duty and active reserve guys that are working there, but the reservists are all out. So, or they never, right. were never in completely in the first place, except maybe boot camp. but it's okay to talk about business and the civilian sector and entrepreneurship and, and those kinds of things. And I, I really love the, the mix of both, uh, in, in the time I spent around, around the reserve units. Sure. And it's also more real. I mean, yeah. you know, it, you, when you've got a year or two to go, you know, you're gathering information, you want data, you want to understand what's possible. Um, but once you get out and, you know, once you start working a company, you understand some of the more uh, real restrictions and, and how it distracts you and how it takes your time. And, and so the conversations are very different. Uh, but I, you can't get started too early. You can't uh, not talk about your dreams enough. I mean, if you're not kicking your ideas around with your friends, then you ought to. And then, you know, once you've done that, then you ought to find a group of trusted advisors who will tear your stuff apart and give you feedback. And, and the sooner you start that and the more you do that, the cleaner your concept will become, the, the, the more clarity you'll get on your business plan, the better you will be when you initially launch in the first place. Cause you'll have walked the dog. I mean, we do it when we go to combat or when we go on patrols or when we go out and do missions. I mean, we, we write an order, we brief an order, we rock walk an order. We, we have people brief back the order. We do rehearsals on the order. All of that stuff is part of our planning process. And then we launch and do the mission. But then a lot of people come out and say, well, you know, I want to start this XYZ business and they don't walk the dog. You know, they don't, they don't set up all the rehearsals uh, that they would have done if they were just doing a, a combat patrol or, or going on a convoy or, or, you know, running a refueling mission. Uh, so the, the pre-flight preps, I think from your world, right? We, we somehow we skip Absolutely. that because we think, you know, well, it's, you know, it's a subway or it's a new marketing campaign or it's a whatever their, you know, their company is. But that pre-work is, is critical. And it starts with, well, it starts with this, you know, people listen in and hear what can be done. And then it starts with, you know, go sit around, you know, at dinner or on a patio somewhere and, and tell your buddies and then let them rip it apart or share with your spouse. Uh, my spouse has had some insight that has stopped me from, from many a, an ambitious but ridiculous move. So, mm -hmm. Uh, but that conversation is critical. Absolutely, yeah. You know the the murder board uh, theory, and um, you got to vet. You got to vet it. You know you get. And I think there's there's kind of a misconception out there that well, I don't want people to know what my idea is because they might steal it. No, and we've talked about that. that on, yeah, we but we've talked about that on the show many times before. Yeah. That's it's not. You know, there, <clears throat> ideas are, are, are ideas are a dime a dozen. There's thousands of them. Right. It's it's taking action on an idea that is what becomes important. And most people, even if it's a great idea, they're not going to go take action on it. So if you're the one that's going to take action on it, then it's okay to share your idea and vet it around to people and right. test, get some tests and eval some data from it before you jump in. So, well, talk us through a little bit about your transition. You, know, you got out of the Marine Corps, but you went into the reserves 
What about your uh, civilian experience? Did you jump right into entrepreneurship, or you work you work in a job for a while? No, I yeah, I had the job. Uh, I get I get hit up by you know the Lucas Group, the Orion uh, Military Headhunters. I okay. went to all those conferences like everyone does. Uh, you know, I, I had gone through the the tap classes where you sit in the base theater with three hundred of your closest friends who all. Uh, you know, have a very clear idea of what they're going to do and they're all wrong. And, uh, <laughs> I went through those programs and I, I did, you know, the, the job interviews and, and it was, uh, you know, two thousands when I was interviewing. So, uh, you know, the, the tech IPOs were rampant, the, the company jobs were everywhere and most of them were sales. Uh, I actually got picked up by a company that is no longer business. They got purchased. Um, but the president of the West coast had been a Marine from Vietnam. And so he, you know, contracted with the military headhunting folks and, and, uh, had gone out and hired three of us in the management training program. Um, and I was the one Marine of the group and, you know, he pulled me aside and said, here's what we're going to do. And here's how we're going to do it. And this is where we're going to go. And so I moved into sales, uh, in financial securities. Uh, so we printed like the, uh, the prospectuses, the IPOs for publicly traded companies and did all the communication with the SEC. Very, very dry stuff. Uh, nothing I had ever prepared for or thought about before. Um, but you know, you tack it with zeal and you study and you become an expert. And, uh, in that job, uh, the war started, uh, I did two years of mobilization, um, in a row and the company was incredibly supportive and I came back and they'd held my job, but they changed me from Orange County to LA. And, and then I did another deployment and, and came back and I, they still held my job. But when I got back the second time, I was starting the job for the third time in a row and I actually got picked up by a, another Marine. Um, he'd gotten out in the seventies in finance and was doing a startup, uh, in healthcare data. So he was doing big data analytics stuff and, and pulled me in to be a special projects guy. And I met him because I was participating in some nonprofits helping veterans. And what I would tell you is, in my experience, uh, you know, we're an amphibious fighting force. And I would say that uh, there's a beachhead on the sole of every other Marine. So you get five minutes. And in, in this case, I, I got my five minutes. I, I talked to uh, the soon to be president of this new startup. And he said, I don't know what you're going to do, but it's special projects and come with us. And so I, I changed jobs. Um, and I did that for you know about six years working in, in healthcare finance, healthcare data. Uh, and in that process, I started going to all these training classes because every sales job, they'll send you to the one or two day training programs. And in these training programs, uh, you know, they, they're trying to teach knowledge. They're, they're trying to make you smart at, you know, the right answer to the right question. So, you know, a sales training program will give you a card that says, okay, the, the client's going to say the price is too high. And now you're going to say, you know, one of these three things. And then in over two days, you're supposed to memorize all the right ways to close the deal or the right ways to lead your team or the right ways to, you know, present information. And what I started realizing was that instead of teaching knowledge, we should teach fluency. Uh, I think the Marine Corps and, and, and the other services do a fine job of, of the NCO schools where we're teaching, you know, our, our corporals and our sergeants how to respond in any environment. You know, we recognize that everyone goes into to the war with a rifle, but you don't know if you're going to fight in the desert or the, or the jungle. And so how you employ your weapon system changes based on the environment. Well, that's sales, that's leadership. You know, you, you are the weapon, right? Your brain, the knowledge that you've acquired, the things that you can do are your weapons, but the environment that you work in is different every time. So we started looking at all the different environments that people could function in, in our sales world. And we realized that instead of knowledge, we needed fluency. We needed people who understood uh, the basics and then could apply them in, in all sorts of different ways. And it was literally on a rifle range with a bunch of Marines where I started explaining all this. And in the process of explaining all of this, uh, I said, well, you know, we ought to do is, is develop a workshop that teaches squad leader school to civilians. That was about eight years ago. And my first sergeant and then one of the sergeants who was a, a college student on a dare said, OK, well, do it. And uh, we picked a date and three of the Marines in the company put on suits and we found three people who paid about two hundred dollars a piece. And I rented out the back half of the dining room at the Long Beach Marriott. Um, and then over two days, I taught a two day squad leader school, which was, you know, SMEAC and JJ did tie buckle and the OODA loop and several other like basic military ideas. And, uh, you know, at lunchtime they'd seat people and they just tried not to put people in tables close to us. But, 
But for two days, we, we rolled through these slides and these six people and the Marines smiled and nodded their heads dutifully. And the other three civilians uh, just took the class. And I took that feedback and, and uh, you know, I still had a job, but I and would the run. Na- the name of the class was Squad Leader to s- Civilian? No, it was the idea was I was taking squad leader school concepts and teaching them to civilians. So the okay. company is called Military Leadership Methods or ML Methods. Okay. And uh, what we do is we teach leadership using war stories and the basic planning, the basic tenets and traits that we're taught in the military, but now we translate it and give it to civilians. And so that first class was just a two day leadership workshop. Uh, and, and so that, that first class eventually became military leadership methods. You didn't really right. know what it was going to be called. No, you I, didn't yeah, know where no it was going to go. It was like, Hey, let's try this. And so you had, you had six people in the class, but, but three of them were incognito Marines pretending. So you could pretend you actually had six when you really only had three. Right. <laughs> uh, right. That's great. And, I love and they're that. All, you know, they got their workbooks and at the end they handed me their workbooks and the workbooks included, you know, all the notes like, you know, Hey sir, this one sucked. <laughs> Drop this out. And why are you saying this? Like nobody needs to know it. And, but you know, we, 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 we filtered through it and, and those three guys, they came once and they never came again. But, uh, like that first sergeant was very supportive. Um, and over the years sent other people in his organization and paid, uh, to have them come to training programs. Uh, and so it was a hobby and, and like many businesses, uh, it started as a hobby and some people will tell you like, Hey, you got to go all in, you got to believe in your dream. And, uh, you know, (laughs) that's great unless you have kids and a wife and a bill. And, um, you know, so I treated it as a way to pay for vacations every year. So I would do two to four classes a year Mm -hmm. and some of them had three people and some of them had 20. Um, most of my programs that I sold were referred from other Marines who now were in leadership positions and just wished that they could get the quality of, uh, basic leadership tenants that they had in the Marine Corps. I mean, is whether you complained about it or not, the Marine Corps is excellent at teaching, uh, the core fundamentals of leadership. And if you want someone who's on time and on budget and on point on, uh, you know, sharing ideas or communicating or, or getting work done, you get a veteran. Um, Absolutely. So, so that's what we, we capitalized on, right? So we, we, we tried to catch that and then teach it in this program. And then about four years ago, uh, it occurred to me that uh, this could actually be a living, that, that I could book enough of these if I just didn't treat it like a hobby. Hey, Garth, hold that thought about going full-time with this. I got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. If you're a veteran interested in a new game plan, 7-Eleven may have what you're looking for. We're talking franchising, you know owning your own store? 7-Eleven's franchise program puts your military experience to work in a structured environment that's all about success. And special military incentives and financing make ownership easier. So think about it. Franchising with the convenience leader. It's a smart game plan for vets and a win for 7-Eleven. Check out the details at veteranonthemove.com slash 7-Eleven. All right, we're back with Garth Massey from uh, Military Leadership Methods. And before the break, uh, Garth was about to go into his transition over to full-time with Military Leadership Methods. But I want to go back real quick for, for someone I want to ask you earlier, Garth, that you were talking about. You know, being a grunt, you got out. You were hired by two different individuals. Granted, they were both older, retired Marines. So they were kind of looking, you know, they knew you were kind of a known quantity to them, familiar to them. But... Can you touch on why they hired you? Because I hear this all the time, especially among the grunts, but even amongst a lot of other military MOSs, oh, all I was was a grunt or all I know is, you know, all all I was was an Intel or all I was was a truck driver or whatever it may be. Why do you think those guys hired you, even though you do nothing about financial securities in the financial markets or investing? Sure. I, well, I, you know, I think we get a powerful education and we don't give it enough credit. Um, you know, why do colleges still teach liberal arts degrees? You know, why do we study philosophy from 2000 years ago? Um, you know, it develops critical thinking. It develops the ability to solve problems and move things into action. Um, you know, so we don't do as much technical work in our colleges as we maybe ought to. And we spend a lot of time developing how people think. And so, you know, the theory is if people know how to find the answers um, and how to challenge assumptions, they'll be better employees someday. So a guy like me with a speech communications degree can then go into the infantry and then get out and get into financial securities. 
And, you know, I tell Marines this all the time, like they, they already know things that everybody wants to hire. It doesn't matter if you know, uh, you know, the details or the ins and out. I mean, I suppose if you were going to perform brain surgery, you, you would want some technical skills. But if you're a comm guy or a motor T guy or a pilot or a finance clerk, all of that uh, came wrapped in a package of show up on time, take initiative. Uh, when there's stuff out there to be known, you know, Marines are good at asking the critical questions of what do I know? Who needs to know it? And have I told them? And although to us, that sounds like something you wouldn't even want to put on a resume and you frankly don't need to, uh, that is what everyone is missing. Uh, you know, this one thing this company has taught me over eight years is that there is, you know, a, a gap in leadership development and in learning and they're not getting it in high school and they're not getting it in college. And so a lot of employers are willing to invest a lot of time and money to level their people up so that they can get the best performance on the job and veterans from all branches uh, come with that prepackaged, but they just have to get out of their own way, right? Like a, a lot of exactly. people will get hung up with, oh, you know, how do I put that on a resume? Well, you don't, but you know, you read about the company before you interview, you, you take a minute on their website and see what they actually do so that you can speak articulately about it. You know, you talk about, uh, you know, your compulsion or your desire to be on time, looking ready for the job, you know, prepared for whatever it is you're about to go into. And, uh, uh, we don't, we don't give ourselves enough credit for that. I mean, and I would tell you every veteran that gets out of the military, I mean, if you peaked when you hung up your uniform, whether you did four years or, you know, 30, uh, shame on you because, you know, four years, you got four years of quality information about how to work as part of a team. And if you did 20 years, you got quality information on that and how to direct and plan and strategize for a team. And you can take that and bring it out into America and bring it out into the workforce. And whether you start a company or work for a company, those skills are skills that other people aren't getting. So whether you can articulate them or not, uh, you're coming with a package that people want. Uh, people want someone they can trust. And so when I got my first job, yes, he was a former Marine and he was a, a vet and, and had gone in Vietnam and fought and he didn't even remember much about it and wouldn't talk about it. Uh, and, but he pulled me into the room and said, here's what I have problems with. If I put you here, can you, can you start working towards this? And, you know, I saluted smartly and clapped my heels and made flashcards and read and studied and, and asked questions and, uh, and took the job. And uh, that's what they were looking for. So I, I don't buy the, you know, you, you got to have one flashy word. I mean, resumes nowadays, they're all screened by computers. A lot of people just take the second half of that first page and just reprint all the words from the ad so that when the computer scans it, it finds the words. I mean, what you need is that five minutes to get you in the interview. Right. You know, your resume is just yeah. something to start a discussion. And the kind of stuff you're talking about, it, it's going to come up in the interview. It's going to come up in the selection process, those kinds of things. And you know what? If it's a company or an HR department that doesn't see or recognize those intangibles, those soft skills, it's very likely that's a company you may not want to work for in the first place. So, oh, yeah. And you can't explain that away. I mean, unless you're talking to the person you're actually going to work for. I mean, the rest of the people in the interview process are literally just trying to screen through the, the dozens or hundreds, or in some cases, thousands of resumes to find people, you know, to, to be able to hand across a handful to the person who's actually going to hire you. So up until that point, I mean, it's just, a, it's a filter when you finally meet the person who's actually going to be your boss, that's your opportunity to really talk about what you can do. And what, exactly. what's important there is, is that they pick up on that sense of drive and determination and, and frankly, resiliency, which is something that, you know, the military gets in droves and we don't talk about enough. I mean, we develop people who have gone through strenuous and uh, emotionally and physically challenging things and they are resilient. It's, it's not about being someone who's never lost. It's about being someone with a winning average and, and still getting up because that person knows how to take a hit and then keep moving. And uh, I, I don't think we give that enough credit. I mean, that's yeah. what I look for when I hire. So. Well said, man. Well said. And yeah, one thing I'll say real quick, the way to get your resume plucked out of the thousands isn't necessarily what's on the resume. You, oftentimes, I've done it myself and I've known a lot of guys, you network your way into the organization and you have someone go pluck your resume for you. <clears throat> yep. And then, and then you take it from there with what we were just talking about. No, if you're looking at this, there is no time. You cannot begin soon enough 
to reach out to people on LinkedIn, to call people you served with in the past and just let them know you're looking. I mean, the, you know, the one good thing that comes out of social media is you can, you can grow that, um, list of contacts, list of networks, bigger, faster than ever before. And and it is so much about who, you know, I mean, if you look at your LinkedIn account and you don't have 500 plus, um, you know, your, your, your account's kind of a hack, you know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. somebody who just said, Oh, I guess I got to play. Like, you know, you just, you got to underestimate the power of LinkedIn. Cause it's very powerful. It's all business, no BS like Facebook and all the others. Sure. And if you call up, if you ping somebody and say, Hey, you know, you, this is me. Um, looking for some help or some or, or some advice on this or that, and you're not trying to sell them something. People have been over backwards to help you out on LinkedIn. So, hey, yeah. I, no, I noticed you work for this company. I'm really wonder if you might be able to share what's like working there. It just some innocent things where it's oh, this is somebody who genuinely just wants some help. It's not they're not trying to sell something or get me to yeah. buy something or you know. yeah. No, if you want to sell, then go, go buy a list and you know spam out like everybody else, but, but for LinkedIn, <laughs> reach out and start with veterans, but you'll find, uh, your network grows fast after that, as long as you're open and willing and you'll get people who are selling you stuff and it's okay. Mm-hmm. It's okay. Sure. Like that's one thing the military needs to get over is that, you know, that's this concept that sales is somehow bad. Um, like get, get over it. We're all in sales, you know, and, right. and we're selling freedom, I guess. But, uh, when you get out in the civilian world, everyone is selling something and it's not bad. Uh, Unfortunately, I'll have veterans come talk to me about wanting to be facilitators or teach leadership, and they'll give me this great resume of all the classes they've taught and how good they are in front of groups and how they were ranked highest in their class for presentations or whatever it is. And my first question is always, great, what do you think of sales? And they go, well, I, mean, I don't really want to do sales. Well, okay, <laughs> then you're not going to make it. Like, If you don't have the desire to get out and find some business, like I'm not going to hand you business. Um, you know, you've got to be able to pick up the phone or, or go out and do a networking luncheon or meet people or, you know, whatever it is. So I would tell the, the other bit of advice, any veteran out there thinking of starting a company, go get a book on, on sales or, you know, go to a conference or something, but, yeah. and you can go old school Zig Ziglar and Tom Hopkins, or, uh, you know, you can, you can try some of the newer ones, but. Yeah. But, Dane Maxwell, uh, who was on the show a while back, recommended the ultimate sales machine. And I, I've, sure. I'm, I'm a little ways into that. It's already fascinating. I mean, it's, uh, I'm the ultimate sales machine is, uh, maybe you have to be a grunt to read that one. There's or pilot, I guess there's a <laughs> lot of ego in that book, but, uh, everything he says is, is pretty spot on. And, uh, you know, if you get past the, you know, kind of the, the chest thumping, uh, that's a great book. I have recommended that to several startup companies. Yeah, when, when he gets down to the the mechanics of okay, this is how you go about it. That's that's where it really it starts to get interesting. I understand you about the sure <laughs> chest thumping. Well, hey man, we kind of digress a little bit uh, before the break. You were about to tell us how you were doing three or four of these uh, teaching military leadership methods to civilians. You're doing these classes three or four times a year just to pay for vacation. And you started to look at going full time. So I want to hear that story. Yeah, it, it kind of came as an epiphany. I mean, the group I was working for had taken several twists and and uh, I was looking at my model and realizing that if I took what was a hobby and frankly was all I ever talked about with friends and, and family and just gave it a, a, a try. And so I called a couple of companies that had done programs in the past um, and I called a couple new companies and found this great little electrical contractor in Denver. And went in and said, hey, you know, here's the new model. <clears throat> Instead of a, a weekend workshop, you really need to do uh, one class a month for six months. You need to invest in learning and development in your people. And to do that, you have to do it over a longer period of time, smaller bites, so that retention goes up. And the trainer said, yeah, that all makes sense. <laughs> and uh, he was not a Marine, uh, had never served. And took it into a CEO and they said, sure, let's do it. And they loaded up a class. And uh, so my first class was in Denver and I flew out once a month and uh, taught this program. And then from there, just started picking up steam. Um, you know, currently I, I do a lot of work in the tech sector, uh, video games. Uh, they are constantly looking to level up their their employees and their supervisors. Really? Uh, construction, healthcare. And, you know, names you've heard of, you know, Blizzard Entertainment, SpaceX, um, hmm. you know, the Standard Interiors, a uh, bunch of other like uh, contractor companies, RHA, Ludwig Electric, uh, Riot Games. Uh, so lots of, of real, you know, large companies are all looking for ways to plus up their leadership development program. And they'll come in and, 
And whether they do a one day workshop like I did with Sprint last week, or they do a full eight month or annual training program, uh, you know, people buy a lot of this stuff. So when you, when, when I made the switch, it was just a matter of like ramping up and, and, and a lot of sales. And then once I'd gotten into the sales, it was about tweaking and building a product um, that really left value, right? Like at the end of the day, if I went in and just told straight war stories and, and did the, the, the chest bumping, like we talked about with the book, uh, you know, that doesn't go over well. But if your focus is on how to create opportunities for them and how to have them come out with a sense of, okay, I've got fluency now. Like I, I know this move and I can do this move in, in three different environments. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's powerful. Um, so some of my clients have been with for three, four years now. Um, you know, some of them, they do a, a six month program and, and I've got this great carpet installer. Um, they, you know, they had six people in their executive team. They've only got, you know, a couple dozen people in the entire company, but they went and did a, a four month program and they've been phenomenal clients and great referrals for other business. So you never know where it's going to come from. Interesting carpet installation. I mean, it's something you wouldn't think about, but I find that very fascinating because I've always thought, you know, there's a lot of these heavy labor intensive companies out there and a lot of their employees just kind of come and go. And I've always wondered like, you know, what would it be like if you, you implemented military leadership, military motivation in an organization like this, you know, how, how well, would, how well received would it be amongst guys that mow yards, dig holes, sure. install carpet, that kind of thing. I would tell you this, uh, it's not that we show up and say, rah, rah, and you know, Hey, if you just get fitter, you can get faster. And we don't, we don't teach that. That's not the part I think that people grab onto, but what they do grab onto is the concepts like commander's intent. Uh, so whether you're mowing lawns or, or, you know, making some high tech wafer, if you can't or don't understand the end state and what you're trying to work towards. If you can't articulate it to your team so that people can rally around the vision of Camelot that you've painted for them, uh, you know, in the military, you know, task, purpose, end state, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but very few people actually do that. I mean, we, we pass along orders from on high and we don't take ownership of them, thus building accountability. And when you take ownership and you create your commander's intent in your own words so that now you're taking your task from higher and making it your mission, um, which is a, you know, just a basic planning tenant taught in the military. Um, getting that concept on the civilian side is so powerful and it, it changes sales teams and it changes operational teams and, and having someone who can articulate the why, you know, the, why are we engaged in this process? Where does this take us? Uh, too often organizations start with a question of how, and that's, that's the wrong way to go about it. I mean, you, uh, you know, if you had to put them in order, you start with what if, and then go through the why. And then once you've finished doing several renditions of that, you can move on to simple things like how, uh, cause how is, you know, blocking and tackling and that just takes a little bit of initiative and some gusto to get into. Yeah. Now, Garth, are you all in now with, uh, oh, yeah. with material? Yeah, all, okay. Yeah. This is all I do. So right now, uh, I, I probably carry about five or so, um, clients a year where I'm doing an annual program with them. So I got once a month, we do outdoor adventure stuff. We do classroom stuff. It's a combination based on what the company is trying to do to accelerate their mid-level managers or their senior level executives. And then, uh, we actually run a mentorship program. So we have a thing called 90 day Boot Camp, And, uh, I've found peers who are, uh, senior combat veteran, uh, officers enlisted, you know, Lieutenant Colonel, Sergeant Majors, Mass Sergeants. And, uh, companies will send us guys who are looking for some mentorship. And so we line them up with this senior combat vet who gives them 90 days of one-on-one time on the phone. And it's the coolest aunt or uncle you never had because uh, they listen to you and they, they talk to you with their sort of wise experience and, and years of, of whatever. And then uh, we have a third program where we do a four week intensive course and uh, it sort of pops up in different cities, different places. So like the next one is in July in Santa Monica and it'll be heavy in tech and every Tuesday night for four weeks. So four classes, people will come out in this group of 20. We'll go through a cohort. We'll go through this training program and then, uh, you know, we'll do one or two or three sometimes a week for the four weeks. So those pop-up classes are great to get in because you get the leadership training, but you also are sitting with people from other industries, you know, so, a, a contractor could be sitting next to, you know, someone from Hulu and, uh, uh, that network can pay dividends, you know, one year, five year, 10 years down the line. Oh yeah. You know, it goes, it goes back to what I was saying. Like, you know, Marines have it easy. 
you know, you, you get five minutes, you can call any Marine and say, look, I, I need five minutes. And if you explain what you want and they say they don't need it, then great. You had your shot. Right. Um, but that's part of that, you know, there's a beachhead on the soul of every other Marine. And, and I, I think it counts, you know, I've never said no when someone has asked for the five minutes and I've said no after the five minutes, if, right. it, if it doesn't match and I've been told no. Um, but you always get that opportunity. Well, why not create that in the civilian world too? Why not give people some commonality? I mean, they're coming at it with different educations. They work for different companies, but they still need to meet each other because they're all going to do business. And that goes back to networking. You've got a network. So this uh, pop-up program um, does that. You know, we, we, we show up in different cities and run this for four weeks. And then once those folks are connected and they've studied the leadership stuff and they've leveled their own game up, you know, then we move it to another city and, and try it somewhere else. So those programs are pretty much fill uh, ML methods all the time. And um, yeah, it's all we do. Hey Garth, uh, how how do we find you? Uh, ML methods, military leadership methods. If if you know somebody's looking to hire you guys, or maybe even get involved, how do we how do we give us a, yeah, be great. a shout out for your company? Yeah, the, I mean the website's the easiest way. In fact, there's a newsletter on the website once a month. Uh, we put a book recommendation and we put out just a key thought on leadership and some videos. Everything can be found at mlmethods.com uh, or you Google military leadership methods, you'll find me. Um, there's a YouTube channel with several like parody videos on leadership. Uh, there's 30 or 40 of them up there right now. And please subscribe to that. Or, uh, you know, we do all the regular Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and then obviously LinkedIn, um, got a great following on LinkedIn and, and you can either follow me or, or follow the company. All right. Hey, one last thing, Garth, we're about out of time. Uh, you've obviously crossed over. You're now a full-time entrepreneur. You know, if you're speaking to that individual that's still in or maybe whatever phase of the transition they're in where they haven't quite become an entrepreneur, but they're thinking they really want to be, you know, tell us what it's like being a full-time entrepreneur and actually actually being in the profit mode. And, and, and what is that like? It's terrifying. <laughs> uh, it's wonderful. It's terrifying. I have been incredibly fortunate. Uh, I have, so four years as a standalone company, four profitable years. Um, we haven't missed our mark yet. Uh, we're looking to expand. Um, you know, I have my phase three plan out there for 2018, 2019, where we want to build a whole leadership Institute, but, um, it's also scary. I mean, uh, uh, my business is very cyclical. People get to the end of second quarter and they go, we're going to make it better for the rest of the year, or they get to the end of the year and they say next year is going to be better. And so November, December, people start talking about contracts, but no one has their budget yet. So I go into every Christmas wondering if I'll have any business next year. And then 90% of my business is signed and paid for uh, in January. And then, you know, suddenly like all the, the tension that carried through the holidays is gone. Um, so be prepared for that, right? Like yeah. the, uh, if you want to start a company and you are the driver, there, there's no gunny who's going to tell you what to wear tomorrow and what time PT is. Hmm. Uh, there's nobody there to backfill when you forget to order Porta Johns or, or you haven't ordered chow correctly. Like if you forget something or miss something, you've forgotten it or missed it. And that's where the adaptability, uh, the resiliency of our military service, you know, will pay off. But I would tell anybody who wants to get into the entrepreneurial gig, like, go for it. I mean, it, you can do fabulous things, but don't hide your idea. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Don't worry about people stealing your idea. If, if you've got it and you can do it and you're unique, rock and roll, get out there, you know, and, and, and test it, um, you know, and, and put the toe in the water and, and try your idea and share it with people because they're going to give you insight that will be invaluable. But then also remember that it, it has its great days and its bad days. Uh, there are days when you're going to move fast and there's days when, you know, you're, you're going to move slow and, and, you know, but if every day you wake up and for those of you who haven't decided to become bearded, uh, veterans, uh, you know, get up, shave, <laughs> put on pants, go into your desk, your office, your garage, wherever it is, sit down and do the work. Uh, and the guys who, and the girls who suffer, uh, who, who struggle are the ones who get up in the morning and then allow themselves to sleep in a couple extra hours because nobody's checking on them. Well, don't be that person just because there's not someone posting the training schedule on the wall. Uh, doesn't mean that you don't have to wake up, get a little PT and eat some breakfast and sit down and, and hit it. Um, if, if you allow yourself to slack off, it shows up in your products. It shows up in your business and, uh, you know, you don't have to drive yourself into the ground, but, but you've got to have a routine and you have to have 
um, you know, some of the, the dependability in your day, uh, those things matter, you know? So again, get up, take a shower, put on clean clothes, put a collared shirt on, whatever it is that is your thing. I mean, put a t-shirt on, I don't care, but go out, sit down and start the work. Garth, man, great, great interview, uh, great information. Uh, we wish we could probably go on for another couple hours about it, but uh, <laughs> of course we got to keep it under, uh, you know, try to keep it in, in a standard commute time. So, no, that's um, fantastic. All right. Good uh, chatting with you. Yeah. Well, hey, uh, um, you, you know, I'm trying to do, working on uh, doing some uh, Facebook live stuff, man. You, you know, you'd be a great, uh, a great guest to have on the Vendor on the Move Facebook group and uh, come on live and allow some uh, interaction with some other veteran entrepreneur types and wannabes, that kind of thing. So hopefully we can do some of that in the future. Yeah, that'd be great. And, uh, you know, feel free to sign up for the newsletter on mlmethods.com. Uh, and then we just launched that veterans nonprofit and it's just a list of veteran friendly companies. So you can go to vabd.org. And if you are an employer, put a, put your company logo up there with a URL where vets can send resumes. And if you're a vet, uh, go scroll through, and, and see what's available or see what kind of companies are out there. Right now, there's only six, but uh, it's only been up for four days. So, you know, it'll grow. Yeah, it's a good start. All yeah. right, Garth. So we're out of here. These two Marines are Oscar Mike. Have you joined the Veteran on the Move Facebook group? I personally invite every guest that I have on the podcast to join the group. So the Veteran on the Move Facebook group is a great way to connect with previous podcast guests. Our Facebook group will keep you in touch with other veterans that are transitioning to entrepreneurship and you will also get great updates and free gouges on the people, programs, and resources that will help you in your transition to entrepreneurship. Thank you for listening to Veteran on the Move, your pathfinder to freedom. If you like the show, leave us a review on iTunes. Reviews are always greatly appreciated. So until next time, this veteran is Oscar Mike.